Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to episode uh, three, two, three of the Spearhead Sundays podcast. I'm your host, Lewis Spears. That's going to make you laugh every episode for the next seven, I reckon, uh, because, uh, oh no, then it's no, then it's just going to be three threes and that'll be boring, but we're going to make the most of it until then. Um, guys, huge news. King Charles has just been diagnosed with cancer and I'm touring, all right? LouisSpears.com. I've got the Melbourne Comedy Festival in April. I got a bunch of shows there. After that, we've got Adelaide. It's on sale. Sydney is on sale. And uh, there'll be some more dates announced very soon. So get your tickets. I want to see you there because who knows what's going to happen. I'll tell you what's going to happen. I think this is a big call. I think this year King Charles abdicates the throne. Okay, because I don't know if, if any of you have tried to sit on a throne with with a with a watermelon sh- shaped growth on your ass. It's very uncomfortable. All right, I think that he's abdicating. You know why? I was doing my research because I've been writing some jokes, and uh, Prince William or whatever. Who's the next in line? William. Willie. All right, that bald guy. Can he shave it? Can he give up? What's with the sideburns? Why would you want to look like Mr. Burns? Have you ever seen... Actually, it looks like more like Homer Simpson, the, the shape of his head. Have you ever seen a guy like that bald keeping it that wasn't like 60? He has the balding haircut of a 60-year-old man. Everyone under 50, if they've got that male pattern baldness, they're shaving the sides. What's he doing? Someone kill the royal barber. <laughs> He's fucking my man Will up. King William. I'm calling it, man. I reckon he abdicates. I think that that King Charles has waited his entire life to sit on the throne for 20 minutes and then abdicate because he's bum hurty. Mm-hmm. I think that's what's going on. And and there'll be a lot more to talk about it. Loosebeers.com, get your tickets. Do you reckon he's going to be fine? I think that they don't... They, they never announce anything until it's like at its end point. Yeah, they probably knew he had cancer. Yeah, they would have known that for ages. But how funny that they probably spent like several tens of millions of dollars to do the whole um, inauguration thing. Is that what it's called? Yes. And they're going to do it again. Oh, I hadn't even thought of that. Yeah, months. they're going to have to do it again. See, this, this is the thing. I mean, this is, you know, is going to happen when, when Joe Biden wins the election. You know, they're going to go through the whole rigmarole. He'll have a stroke in his, in his first month. Another stroke. We, he's had a few that we haven't been <laughs> we haven't been told about. <laughs> Did you see Biden up there on the stage talking about a meeting that he just had with the French president? It's so funny. He goes, uh, "I was just at a meeting with the French president, uh, with the French prime minister, uh, and uh, he says this, and then he says the name of a French prime minister from the eighties." <laughs> Who I imagine must have been Prime Minister when Joe Biden had a lot more mental faculty and a lot more to do with, you know, foreign governments. (laughs) So he's just referencing a a dead Prime Minister, by the way. The guy's no longer alive, I believe. But even if he is alive, he's not the fucking Prime Minister. It was Trudeau, right? I don't know how you could could forget a guy in blackface. Trudeau? Trudeau. Sorry. (laughs) (laughs) (sighs) It's really hard to make fun of Joe Biden when you're also retarded. (laughs) Who's the French Prime Minister? Macron. Macron, yeah. Yeah, I know that. I got confused because Trudeau, they speak French in Canada. (laughs) And he speaks French. And the French are also very racist. Um, But anyway. (laughs) Dude, I'm so embarrassed because here's the thing about me. I'm not 100 years old. So when Biden fucks up like that, it's like it's embarrassing because, yes, he's the president. But everyone is like, yeah, but also he is 100 years old. I'm 30. All right, and and I supposedly got a surgery that fixed my mental faculties. Maybe they put a bit of Biden in me. Anyway, how bloody stupid's Joe Biden? How smart am I? <laughs> this is why you should get all of your political news and opinions from me, because not only am I uh, really uh, misinformed, I'm also very hypocritical, and that's kind of what you want from a political commentator, isn't it? Just a guy saying a bunch of stuff. <laughs> No! Sorry. Um, anyway, right? He goes, uh, I was uh, talking with the French Prime Minister, references a guy from the 80s, and then he goes, I said to him, America's back. 
Uh, um, and then he just kind of trails off. And then he goes, and then this French prime minister from the 80s goes, where have you been? <laughs> this is why I thought of Trudeau, because he references Trudeau. we got to fucking pull it up. It's so funny. I just love, you know, Shane Gillis, I watched his special the last night again, and he said the funniest, you know, every now and then a comedian will tell a, would say just a sentence that makes me just so mad because it's just perfect. And it's such a, it's like an observation that anyone in the world could have made and said, and it would be hilarious, but they're the only ones that noticed it and said it. And it's so true, which are the best jokes of like, you say it, you hear a comedian say it, you can go and tell your mom. And she goes, oh yes, right? He goes, uh, he's talking about Biden and he goes, dude, every time a Joe Biden speech finishes, he just turns into a Roomba. <laughs> And then he does. Every time I watch a Joe Biden speech finish, he goes, thank you. And then he just starts bumping into obstacles and searching for a way out. Like he's trying to map out the stage to vacuum it. After I was elected, I went to a, what they call a G7 meeting, all the NATO leaders. And I was in, I was in the south of England. And I sat down and I said, America's back. And later on from Germany, I mean, from... Materon is the French prime minister from the 80s. So he goes, Materon from Germany. So it's the wrong, it's the wrong president of the wrong country and it's the wrong fucking name. France looked at me and said, uh, said, you know, why, why, how, how long are you back for? And I looked at him and the, and the chancellor of Germany said, what would you say, Mr. President? Oh my God. So fucking funny. Just so, just so good that, and also that was supposed to be a joke that probably would have gotten a little tipple of laughter, but because he said the wrong president's name, said the wrong country as well, and then trailed off in the silence for a good seven seconds, people in the audience who love him were like, oh. It's not what you want, you know? It's not what you want. How are those the two guys? They're, they're the best. They're not the best. They're just like what the machine wants to, to fight. I can't wait to see the debates. God, I don't think they're going to let them happen. There's no way that they're going to let Donald Trump stand next to fucking Joe Biden and have a debate. He's going to just bully the guy and point out how... Because you can say what you want about Trump's opinions... At least his brain functions well enough to deliver them. Even if he's wrong, he knows what he's saying. <laughs> like, he might not know that it's right. He might be saying the wrong thing, but he knows that he is saying it. Biden's like, what day is it? Fucking next week? Anyway, I, uh, I had a gig on Saturday night. Now, if you listened to last episode, you would have heard the tale of me just bombing, eating shit right? I bombed terribly. I did really, really badly in Perth. I had three great, amazing gigs in a row. I had a fourth. I offended the crowd way too much. Just ate shit. Silence. Offended gasps. Nothing, right? Really bad bomb. But I thought, that's all right. I'm coming home to Melbourne. I'm going to redeem myself. I'm going to do another gig. And I, and I booked one of my favorite gigs, Kings of Comedy, run by a guy I've known for like almost my entire comedy career, a guy called Simon Hughes. And uh, it's awesome. 120 people, ticketed, fully sold out. And he goes, get there at 8.10. I'm like, all right, that's a little bit later than usual. That's good. I'm going to be on like last, which is awesome for me. Because whenever you put me on first, the crowd needs a little bit of warming up for the stuff that I do. I get there. And I'm super excited. All these other comics haven't seen me for ages. Bro, look at your chin. Are you excited? Blah, blah, blah. All that. I get on stage. Uh, the guy before me, like, annihilated. I'm like, let's fucking go. It's a super hot crowd. I get up and uh, I start talking and I say hello. They clap me up. And then I say my first joke and it doesn't hit. I'm like, all good. No worries. We've all been here. I move on. I'm a professional. I've been doing this for a long time. I say my second joke. Silence. I'm like, well, good. I'll get him with the third one, all right? I'll get him with the third one because the third one's good. I know it's good. I do the third one. Silence. 
I'm now I'm like having flashbacks. Now I'm having Vietnam flashbacks to me eating shit on Sunday. And then I go, all right, they're not liking this stuff. It's too silly. I'm going to switch to dark. <laughs> Which is never really what you want to do when you're eating shit is go from silly to dark. Normally, if I'm eating shit, it's because I've gone way too dark. I need to switch to silly, right? But I'm like, all right, I'm pulling out the emergency rip cords because this is a paid gig and it's a very important gig. Because the one that I bombed at in Perth, whatever, I'm never going to see that guy again. Who cares? Whatever. This one, I want to do all the time. So I'm like, I have to do a good job. I, I go into my other gear about the Dalai Lama. Silence. I'm eating shit. I literally go, oh, have you heard of the Dalai Lama? And I do a few jokes, silence. And then I go, I talk to one guy. I'm like, you know the Dalai Lama? He goes, no. I'm like, what the fuck? No one knows the Dalai Lama? I ask another person. They go, I don't know. They're hostile. I'm up there. I'm booked for 10 minutes. I get three minutes in. I've had zero laughter. And I'm talking zero. Like I'm bombing way worse than before. It's actually like... The one that I bombed at, there were 30 people there. Three of them were laughing. They were loving it. The rest of them were offended. So that's fun. Like, I, like that's great because I know, and I had just done these jokes somewhere else where I smashed, so I know that it's not me, it's them. And it turns out that the lights were on anyway. So it was like the venue, the guy that ran the venue apologized to me. This one, because I was so fucking damaged from the last bomb I had, I checked that all the lights and everything were on. The guy that was on before me did really, really well. It's a hot crowd. So I'm like, this is just my fault. I'm just eating shit. They fucking hate me. And dude, they hate me. It's hostile. I'm not getting anyone. There's 120 people there. Silence. I'm bombing. And I start bombing so badly that I start stumbling over punchlines. <laughs> I'm nervous. You know, I feel like I'm drowning. You know those, like, uh, those scenes from TV shows where someone's like talking in public and and the screen starts to go all wavy and hazy and weird. They start like having a panic attack. I always used to watch those and go, that doesn't happen. That's bullshit. That was happening to me. <laughs> I, I felt like I was like, the, everything was waving so much. I felt like a flashback was about to happen. It was awful. And then I get five minutes in, so I'm halfway through. I haven't gotten a single laugh. Like, I'm, like, bombing. Like, I can't, I cannot even explain how badly I'm doing. I haven't gotten a single laugh from 120 people there. There's no redeeming qualities about this at all. I'm eating shit so badly that now I'm getting angry and I'm, and I'm feeling really shit about myself. And then I push on, because I'm trying, uh, and the guy running the gig flashes me. He, sh he shows me the light. Now, I'm booked for 10 minutes. He's flashing me at five. So even the guy running the fucking room is like, dude, get off stage. This sucks. And now I see that and I go, oh, my God. Not only am I bombing so badly in front of the audience, but the guy running the room wants me off stage. That's how badly I'm doing. I'm never going to get booked here again. So now I'm not even on stage in my head. Now I'm thinking, where the fuck am I going to try new material? Where am I going to do good gigs? I fucking hate this country. I want to get out of here. I want to move to New York and perform at clubs. I'm like, in on stage, I'm going, I'm booking a flight. I'm fucking leaving. This place sucks. It's over. I'm never going to get booked here again. All these comedians were really excited to see me. They haven't seen me for years. They're fucking watching me and, and the guy's like flashing me going, get off stage. I'm like, oh my God, I fucking lost it. I must have fluked those good gigs that I did in Perth. I push on, I go, I'm going to do one more. I pull out my best and you've seen it, always crushes. It's, it's never done. Even at that gig that I was bombing with on Sunday, I hit him with the final joke and I got everyone at least with my last joke. I pull out that one because I'm like, I need to end on something. Dude. Someone coughed <laughs> and I heard it. I was like, and punchline. <coughs> I was like, and I literally go, look, I think I'm going to go home and kill myself. <laughs> I've been Lewis Spears. Have a good night. And I get off stage. And just when you thought it couldn't get any fucking worse, when I get off stage, the audience, 120 of them, in unison, start celebrating <laughs> that I'm getting off. What? 
Like I go, I'm going to kill myself. And 120 people went, yeah. And like clapping at me, celebrating that I'm gone. And then the guy running the room, the MC gets back on stage and they go even more nuts for him. Like, yeah, it's not that guy. It's not the guy that fucking sucks. And I'm watching this going, oh my God, I fucking filmed it all on my camera thinking it was going to be a good gig. So I just fucking pick up my camera and I go to leave the venue. And then the crowd is going fucking ballistic. And I'm like, oh my God, that's the worst. I fucking, I don't, I don't know if I can do another gig in Melbourne. I hate this. I fucking hate doing these gigs. I want to fucking quit. I just want to finish this tour and move countries. I'm like, I'm spiraling. I'm like, this is fucked. I didn't go through all this surgery just to get up here and fucking bomb. Maybe I've took so much time off that I fucking suck. Uh, and I've just lost it. I, this is, I feel, I'm feeling horrible. And then out from the fucking curtains pops these two fucking YouTube pranksters from Misfit Minds. Oh. It was a fucking setup. Oh. They organized the whole thing. They got the fucking crowd in on it. 120 people all were told when this guy gets up, do not laugh. The room runner was in on it. All the other comedians were in on it. All these fucking cameras with their flash on start coming out going, oh, hey, we got ya. I'm like, oh my God. I fucking, I'm like literally booking flights in my head. And they're like, yeah, hey, we got ya, you fucking cunts. Dude, I've never been got like that before, ever. That's awesome. So funny. So that video is going to come out on their channel in a few weeks. And I'm going to make a video of my perspective. Because I just coincidentally happened to vlog my way there and, and be like, oh, I'm back in Melbourne. I'm excited to do a gig. And I filmed it and everything. So, dude, it was so brutal. The audience did such a good job. Uh, like, there was only... I lied. There was one woman that couldn't hold it together. Like out of 120 people, there was like literally, I remember her name and then was Sally. <laughs> and she's pissing herself at one joke that she held on for three minutes. And then I told one joke and she just starts to lose it in the front row, just her by herself, which is so weird because everyone else is like dead silent. And then I kind of talk to her a little bit and then I move on and try to win over the rest of the crowd. And then a bunch of people start talking to her. I'm like, what are you guys talking about? They were telling her to shut up. I was sh ruining it. <laughs> and that's why, like, I go, I go to the guy in the front row. I go, oh, do you know who the Dalai Lama is? He goes, no. <laughs> I'm like, what? Who am I performing to? I ask his friend, do you know the Dalai Lama? And he goes, nah. Like, they were really hostile. That's awesome. It was, it was such a, like, because, um, you know, when you bomb, you normally... Bombing is like most of the crowd hates you, but some people like you. This was everyone hated me and everyone was like, it felt so, because they were there like we're, we're trying not to laugh. It's like the opposite energy of what you get with most comedy crowds where like they, even if you suck, the crowd is sitting there going, we're going to try and laugh. So it's at least an open, receptive energy. So I got up there and obviously I have no idea what's going on. And I just felt this fucking really hostile, no, nah, we're not letting you in energy. <laughs> it was the fucking worst, dude. Oh man. So they really, really got me. I was like, luckily I took it very well because, <laughs> you know, and you know what? It's the guy ended up flashing me the guy running the room, giving me the light, telling me to get off stage. I now know because he felt so bad for me <laughs> that apparently he was begging the boys, can you please, let, like after three minutes, he runs up to them going, can you please let me stop him? This is horrible. <laughs> he goes, I feel so bad. Can you play? And they're like, nah, let him keep going. And thank God they let him stop me. Because if I had, I was only five minutes in. If I had to do another five minutes, you would have got your Kramer moment on camera. Did you actually say, I'm going to go kill myself? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's go. I said, oh my God. what else did I say? There was actually one point where I, and I, I had no idea that it was a prank, but I literally hit a joke and to silence, like a real confusing, like this has never happened before <laughs> silence. I literally go, I feel like you guys have all gotten together and agreed to not laugh. <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> and that, that might, it, I, I think, I'll have to watch the footage back, but I think a few people were like, <laughs> like he's onto us. <laughs> oh, that's so good.
good. Who, what, who were the other comedians that were there? Um, I think a guy called Richard S- Stubbs. Um, and a guy called Alessio. Oh, yeah. And a guy called Simon Hughes who runs the gig. Yeah. Uh, they're all really good. And I felt really bad for, for, I think his name was Richard Stubbs. I only just met him. But he had to go on after me, which is so weird, right? Because I had just like hit like a manufactured fake bomb, the audience like not laughing. And then he had to like follow it and headline and bring it back. But he ended up doing really well. Dude, The I stayed around for the end and on the way out, it was like normally normally when I do a show and I wait for people to to, to see me on the way out, you know, I'm like, thanks for coming. And they're like, we loved it. It was so good. Or if they didn't like it, they'll kind of just give you a nice smile and walk out. This time I wasn't, I didn't have to say anything to anyone. Every single person goes, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> like they, the whole audience felt so guilty. They come to me like, you were, you were actually really funny. It was really hard not to laugh. I'm so sorry. It looked horrible. And like they felt <laughs> the audience had an awful feeling of guilt. It's like they felt almost as bad as I did up there. One one guy was like, dude, I was up the back. I was covering my mouth. I couldn't I couldn't not laugh, dude. You're so good. I'm sorry. Fuck, it was so brutal. But you know what? It's one of those things like it made me realize how mean the that punk show is. Cause that doesn't really meet the standard of like an okay prank on that show. Punked was like these celebrities would have people yelling at them, like abusing them or, or I think I've seen one where like a celebrity killed someone's dog by accident, right? Obviously not in real life, but the prank is like, oh, you killed my dog. How could you do this? My dog's dead. Like yelling at this girl who's crying. Yeah. There was one with Zach Braff where he started like, attacking a child <laughs> yeah. yeah right and like but it, because he thought the prank was real so he started attacking a kid because the, the prank was the kid was destroying his car yeah and, and it's like to put people in in situations like that it's fucked <laughs> you know and then it's this whole thing as well of like because i've never been pranked like that before i've done a lot of pranks but I've never done pranks like that to people. I've like tricked big organizations. I've never really gotten like a person and certainly not like that. It's like afterwards. So I find that it's a prank and immediately I'm laughing. I think it's so funny. I'm pissing myself. But my body for the for like two days after is like, it's still like, man, you bombed real bad last night. And it's like my brain is trying to tell my body that it was all right, but it's still like, fuck, that was all. So I now I'm like, I go to Simon and say, like, very funny, but you have to book me for a real one, you bastard. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm doing it uh, very soon, which is so, oh man, it was brutal. But I think that video is coming out in like three weeks or something on their channel. So good. Really, really, really got me. But now I need to get my revenge. Um, but we're going to have to let that sit for a little bit. Mm-hmm. Let them feel safe. Yeah. Um, in other news, uh, have you seen Jacob Elordi in the news for beating the shit out of a Kyle and Jackie O producer? Yes. Can. So I saw this the article when it, when the details were really hazy. So first it was like Jacob Elordi gets into altercation with Guy at pub. And this is how you know the guy's Australian. Like the dude's like, he's like 6'4". I didn't realize he was so big. I thought he was kind of small. Um but he's like 6'4", so he's like a really big guy. That's only a little bit smaller than me. So like the guy's big and he's like very muscular as well. Like big guy. Apparently, Kyle and Jackie O producer. Kyle and Jackie O is a radio show that we have here in Australia. And we'll get into them later. Um, best show. Best show. Yeah, okay. See, and, and that's a real indicator of the quality of the show. Or well, not the quality of the show, just like the the type of person <laughs> that likes their antics. You know, the type of antics, uh, the type of people their antics attract. He's like a guy that's like, dude, I can't believe they did that. That's fucked. I love it. <laughs> big reason. And, and that's fine because that's a big reason why you're even in this room. <laughs> um, but uh, Kyle and Jackie O producer comes up to him with like a bunch of bath water, apparently, and tries to get him to drink it. And is filming him on camera while he's out at a pub. No, there's no. So, well, you're right. Didn't get him to drink it. Wanted him to get like cum in it. I think because in the movie Saltburn, 
I think in the movie, it's, oh yeah, in the movie, someone comes in it in bath water or jacks off in the bath, and then is it Jacob Elordi's character who drinks the bath water, or is it someone else? I'm not sure because the the producer was trying to get Jacob Elordi to give him something to give to Jackie O. So I think it was oh, was implied come in this water so I can give it to Jackie O. So so the prank was they were going to sexually harass the guy at the pub. I think basically. I think so. Yeah. Okay. That's. I mean, that's not really a good one, is it? No. Walking up to a, a celebrity and and being like, "Hey, can you come in this liquid for me?" <laughs> yeah. It's and secretly filming it. Like if I didn't, if someone did that to me and I didn't know that it was a prank or filmed, I'd be like, get this fucking freak away from me. And if no one else did it, then I would. Like it's, I feel like it's a reasonable reaction. But then also to find out that the guy works at the Kyle and Jackie O show. I mean, even if he wasn't sexually harassing someone, that's almost grounds for a choking. <laughs> they're like, uh, they're like shock jocks is basically what they do. They do outlandish things. One of their... um. One of their famous stunts that got them kicked off radio. Like, to, to put it in context, when Luke and I were doing radio, when we were doing training, you had to do uh, a bunch of safety and quality standards training, like where you learn a bunch of things that you're not allowed to say on radio. Like an example of it is uh, if a famous person uh, commits suicide, you're not allowed to say they're in a better place or at least they're at peace because that makes it sound like it's an option. So like a lot of standard things like that, but then a lot of things like here are words you can say, here are words you can't say, all that kind of stuff. So they would give you a positive example. So if you have to talk about sex, here's a good way to talk about it. Uh, and here's, a, here's a, a way that would violate the radio standards. And they had examples. And for all the good examples, it was lots of different people, Hamish and Andy, a bunch of other radio talent. But for every single example of what not to do, literally they played a clip from Kyle and Jackie O. <laughs> and, and then they went, and this got the radio station fined this much money. Um, so that's the kind, that's like really d during the training, that's what we went through. We just watched clips of Kyle and Jackie O breaking the rules. And you know what? They're the biggest radio show in the country. So the rules are kind of holding the industry back as a whole, it seems. Anyway, right. I think it's awesome. I think that's sick. I think that that just makes Jacob Elordi so much more Australian. You know, like he's not some American celebrity. Like if you come up to him and ask him to, to, to come in a, in a body of liquid, he's going to choke you out at the pub. Let's go. He's from Queensland, after all. Melbourne. Isn't he from Queensland? He went to St. Kevin's. I think the debate is whether or not he's a Melbourne boy or a Queensland boy. Oh. I think he had kind of a bit of both. Oh, okay. And I think that him choking out a dude really confirms... It's Queensland. That, that's very Queensland, yeah. you know? Like, if, if, if he really was a Melbourne boy... He probably would have come in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> but now his mother is in trouble as well, which is really which is really strange. Jacob Elordi mother, she's also in trouble for like the same thing. Kinda, is what I saw. Um Jacob Elordi's mum launches an angry tirade after her saltburn actor son's altercation with Kiss FM staffer outside popular <laughs> Sydney pub. This is so good. Um, she's lashed out at media. Um, this is so good. This is how the media ex ex uh, explains it. Uh, Fox, who's the guy, approached Jacob Elordi uh, to film a stunt for the Kyle and Jackie O show and claims the actor became enraged and grabbed his throat after he ignored the Euphoria star's, star's request to delete the footage. <laughs> when really what happened was the guy was like, hey, can you come in this? <laughs> hey, man, can you come in this? And he's filming it. Hey, dude, could you come in this? Like, yeah, dude, you're getting choked. If you do that to a stranger, <laughs> you're going to get, you're lucky if you only get choked, you know? So good. Um, Daily Mail Australia contacted the actor's parents, Melissa and John, who live in Brisbane's leafy northern suburbs, to see if the, Brisbane. See you go. There you go. See if they could shed light on his side of the story. However, before the reporter could ask a question, Mrs. Alordi burst into an angry tirade. This is so good. I love Mrs. Alordi. What do you think you were going to achieve by coming here? 
so you can spend more bullshit. How disrespectful and rude of you to come here, she said, slamming the door in the reporter's face. Yeah, fuck off. I hate this shit. I don't want this type of like celebrity paparazzi bullshit to happen in Australia. Like this is like an American thing of like harassing celebrities and following them and bumping into, you know, like a prank is a prank, but like going up to a dude in a pub and going, can you come in? This is like wild. Yeah. I think that's weird. And then going in, and then other members of the media going to a fucking parent's house and like staking outside and asking them questions and recording them and then publishing them to tell them to fuck off. Like his, his parents aren't famous, you know? Like maybe if they were also A-listers, it's like, I don't know. I just think this, this paparazzi bullshit is so lame. And that's a huge reason why all these American celebrities moved to like um, Byron Bay and shit like that because we don't have this culture that they have in LA where like you can't go to do your laundry or go down to the shops without getting followed by like 40 dudes on motorbikes going, Hey, Hey Justin. Hey Justin, how's your ex? <laughs> it's like, dude, I think, uh, I think you should be allowed to choke one paparazzi a month. Not all of them, but just one a month. I want to see what, um, this guy said. Um, this is so funny. Fox playfully asked the actor for a sample of his bathwater as a gift to radio host Jackie O. The request is a reference to an infamous scene in Alordi's runaway hit film, which uh, another character drinks Alordi's bathwater. Yeah. Oh, it's, so it's got nothing to do with calm. That was my bad. Yeah, okay. All right. I That's a little bit less less bad. He said he initially obliged and deleted the file, but when Alordi then asked him to delete it from his recently deleted files folder, Fox refused. <laughs> so, yeah, it's like... You come up to the guy in a private moment and you film him and he goes reasonably, he's like, hey man, can you please delete that? And then the guy does, del pretends to delete it. That's the, that's the shitty thing. It's like, if you're not going to do it, then just fucking leave. You know, yeah. don't, just don't delete it. But then he pretends to do it. I think that's, yeah, weird. I'm thinking if I delete this footage, there's no evidence that this encounter in happened. He then alleged a lordy who stands at 1.96 meters. Yeah, let's go. Got up in his face and backed him against a wall and grabbed his throat as two male <laughs> friends surrounded him on either side. Yeah, let's go. Private school boys. <laughs> you know, that's what happens. You know, he's from Queensland, but he also went to a private school. So his boys are going to fuck you up. I like that. Yeah. That's so funny. Um... Yeah, I don't know. I just, like, leave people alone. <laughs> um, all right, what else has been happening? I went to, uh, on my way home, I wanted to talk about this last week. Uh, I was at the airport and I had the funniest thing, right? I'm really good at airports. I've been smashing them for a long time. And one thing that I'm really, really good at is the bit where you put your bags on the conveyor belt. I smash that every time. Although, I've noticed a lot... It's, I'm going to have to fly a few more times, but the last couple times I've flown, I have ended up getting searched and I think it's because they see the screws and all the metal detector set. set some, it's after I've gone through the thing where you have to do the T-pose. Yeah. I do that and then both times I've gotten like properly searched and looked at and, it's, and I notice the guy's face look at the screen. I don't know what they can see, but I think they see something in my head or the fucking metal or whatever it is. Anyway, I do the bag thing. I separate my stuff. I fucking nail it. Seconds. And then I'm stuck behind this idiot who took ages, right? And then they wanted to search my bag because there's a lot of tech in it and something must have gone off, whatever. And I'm stuck behind this dude who's already getting his bag searched. And this guy pulls out this fucking tool that looks like a, it looks like a giant metal syringe. And the guy's like, oh, what is this? And he like clicks it. And then the guy whose bag he's searching is going, don't do that, don't do that. I'm like, oh my God, what's going? And as soon as the other guy goes, don't do that, four other guys come over and like, oh my God, what is this thing? He's like clicking it, pressing the button. The guy said, don't, 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 don't. And then, and then the, the, the guy going, who, like touching the stuff is like, why? What is this? What do you have? And he goes, it's, a, it's an adjuster. I'm a chiropractor. Have you seen those things on TikTok? It's like, it looks like a big metal syringe and it, you push it against a pressure point or whatever and it clicks. Have you seen these? No. They're, 
let me pull it up. I'll show you. Adjuster chiropractor. What it is, is it's like, it's like a giant um, pen, basically, but that has a big handle. It's this. Um, it's called the activator. The activator. That's and, what it um, is. A lot of chiropractors use this to adjust. It's kind of a new technology that was um, founded within the 50s, the 1950s. Um, it's very simple yet effective. Um, so the way that it works is you change the amount of um, newtons um, with this nozzle here. So if I'm adjusting uh, something like the lower back or the sacrum or um, the sacroiliac joint, any any lower back. That's here, not doing anything. So I'd add a certain amount of newtons here, so you can see that the ring gets a little bit larger. A certain amount of newtons. The neck or a more delicate oh my god. Area like the wrist. Um, and you can just you see the footage, and it just it's like it like clicks and presses. There's no fucking way those things do anything. And the guy's freaking out about it. And he goes, it's very sensitive. Those are $2,000. And I just wanted to go, hey, man, chiropractic is pseudoscience anyway. That tool's bullshit. I, I, just, I really just, I was seconds away from going, don't worry, man. It doesn't work anyway. <laughs> this dude's freaking out. Don't mind my adjuster. I need that to scam clients out of an extra $70 every appointment. I can use my adjusting tool. It, I mean, you'd, you'd be better off using a fucking clicking pen. <laughs> on people's backs and the guy searching his bag is like dude i have to touch the mysterious metal object that i mean it could have been a flick knife you know it could have been any it could have been a gun he's going don't don't click that don't and it's like dude if it's that fragile it probably doesn't fucking work all right you're a chiropractor. Your whole industry is fucking pseudoscience anyway. Apparently the Australian one is kind of legit. It's the American one that's like full on, like just does not work and is really dangerous. All that adjusting stuff that they do. There's so many people that like, especially getting, apparently getting your neck adjusted. They can like, if they twist it too much, they can like sever blood vessels and then you have brain death or a stroke and it happens like fairly often. Fuck. Like in America, I don't know about Australia, but I know that in America, they're like not certified. They're just like, I've, I'm a chiropractor and like no real medical board is overseeing them. It's just like a guy who can make your bones crack and people hear the crack and they go, it's working. And it's like, no, it's not, it's hurting. <laughs> but I also don't really know anything about it. Um. All right, what else do we have here? Have you uh, have you seen have you searched Drake on Twitter recently? I did. I did see that he made a, a post about this, but I don't know what happened. So I was uh, I was an unsuspecting victim of this. Oh, I log on to Twitter, uh, and the podcast was coming up. So I'm like, oh, let's have a look at what trend what's trending. I see that Drake's trending, and I click on the thing, and I just see his cock. Actually. Like full on, he's like this and he's filming and he's like waggling it around. <laughs> it's real bad. It's like really, really, really obviously him and just full on like nuts and ass crack oh. and cock. Like filming and it's like, bro. And it's uh and and it it really does it really does confirm that I don't think it's very possible for dudes to take a good nude. Or it or at the very least, we haven't figured it out yet. It's very difficult for men to take a good nude. I would say that it's even harder for men to take a nude video because Drake has a piece on him and he's also Drake, but it just looks like he's waving a pool noodle around. All right? It, it's not, there's no art in it. It's not very tasteful. It's like he had a stack of money and was like, look at this. Can I see the video? I don't have Twitter. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't have it. I don't know if you're even going to find it. You know, the websites have gotten pretty good at when nudes leak. You can't really find them. I can find it. But, <laughs> okay. Keelan's going to go on a mission, mission to find it. I think the problem with male nudes is... Ah! <laughs> <laughs> oh! <laughs> oh! <laughs> Why does it get thicker towards the top? <laughs> That's nuts. That's nuts. Yeah. Oh man. That's, that's nuts. You know, no, pun intended. Oh my god. <laughs> the 
I just think it's. <laughs> Have you found the video yet, or just no, the images? <laughs> the video is even funnier. Just this is so funny. Yeah, it is. It is very funny. I think it's uh, it the the. I think the problem with the male nude is that, especially when it becomes a video, it just it's it just becomes funny. Yes. Like waving waving around like a like a large but only 70% hard penis is just a funny image. <laughs> like it looks like he's outside a car dealership trying to sell a car, you know what I mean? It looks like those those waving <laughs> tube men. I just think that the male nude is an art form that no man has unlocked yet. No one's worked it out. I'm sure that if you got a woman involved, like if you had a female photographer who could pose you, I feel like women could could make it work because let's be real all right women are experts at this there are there have been plenty of female nudes that have been posted willingly and that have been leaked that everyone has just universally gone that's awesome that's like that's that's very alluring i can't think of a single male nude that's been posted willingly or otherwise that hasn't just been funny like it's either gross or funny or both the male nude is an art form that I don't think the male mind can ever perfect or master. And Drake is another victim of this, of like, you know, I feel sorry for him. It's so fucked. I do think it's, uh, it is, it is always like very illuminating whenever a man's nudes leak. Like just the difference in reaction from the general public and women especially uh between like when the fappening happened remember that when all of those female celebrities got their shit leaked all at once like they logged into their apple id or or, or icloud or whatever hacked into them and just leaked like jennifer lawrence was the probably the worst hit by it and all of these other poor women uh it turned into this huge like awful horrible thing that happened but with whenever it's a man you just see women scrambling unashamedly to have a look at it. And then it becomes like a funny thing. And it's like, ah, oh, this is great. And there's, ne there's never any like similar discussion. Whereas, whereas really, really with the fappening, it was, I, it was like the same thing where like a bunch of dudes were like, fuck yeah, Jennifer Lawrence is so hot and scrambled to find it. But then there was this huge backlash. And I feel like most people were like, all right, that's, that's not good, you know? This is not a thing that we should be celebrating or encouraging. This is bad. But you never see the, the reverse when it's like male celebrities getting leaked, especially attractive male celebrities, you know? If they're ugly, it's funny, and if they're attractive, it's like winning the lottery. <laughs> um, so, yeah, shout-out to Drake, another victim of uh, just the dudes trying to take a sexy nude and it just end up being funny. I feel like that's that's it. There's there's whenever you're taking a dick pic, it's just gross or funny or both. Yeah. There's no no one's like, damn. I think it is the only way to do it. The closest you can come come is uh is mystery. If you the minute you show hog, it's funny. That's what I think. If you show like uh root that could be mysterious and sexy. Oh, what's in there? But the the minute, you know, you're showing off perennium, it's over. Is that a part of the, the male anatomy, the perennium? Why do I know that? I'll look it up. Yeah, can you fact check me? I feel like that's uh that's true. That's a funny word, the perennium. So even even the different types of names, the different words used to describe pieces of the penis are funny. Scroton. The area of the body between the anus and the vulva in females. In and, females? And between the anus and scrotum in males. The gooch. The perennium. You see? I would I would argue if you have a look at those Drake photos, it's mostly perennium. <laughs> and it's just not a sexy area. No one's like, yeah, show me your perennium. That is one fetish that I've never seen. You know? There's feet. There's... <laughs> Killers looking at medical diagrams and laughing. <laughs> Penis. See, this is the thing. You can't even show like a medical diagram of a, of a hog and not laugh. Anus. Yeah. Yeah. See, I like that. I've never seen a perennium fetish. There's even like armpit fetishes. 
Which I would argue the perineum is kind of the armpit of the of the anus and penis. You know? It's the space between the armpit is a space between my arm and my chest. You know? The perineum is the armpit of the ass, and no one's into it. Mm-hmm. And so severely underlooked area. Underlooked and underlicked. <laughs> maybe there are a few perineum fetishes out there. They're just maybe there's maybe that's if there are any ladies out there thinking of who they should cater to. There's like maybe that's a niche that you could get into. A gap in the market, pun intended. You know I saw the wildest thing the other day? Saw this girl on Instagram who has a an OnlyFans, like a regular one, right? That's all good, whatever. But then she had a, another account because she's kind of a bigger girl where she has like a whole other account with a whole separate name, like a full-on like different persona that they don't interact, right? She's got one over here on OnlyFans and she's got this name. And then she has another name and another separate OnlyFans account and... She just posts her belly. Oh, right. And and kind of alludes to being pregnant. She's not. She's just kind of a bigger girl. And she was talking about it on a... I think it was a, a podcast clip that I saw. She was talking about it, about how, like, all these dudes were into her regular, like, normal vanilla OnlyFans type stuff. But she started getting an influx of dudes that thought she was pregnant and were into that. And then she was like, wow, fuck, this is like a big niche that these dudes are searching for. Because you think about it, if you're into pregnant chicks, right, already tiny, tiny market and it lasts for nine months. And really, you're probably only into third trimester. So you've got three months of, (laughs) of content out of like a very small, tiny little group of women who would be pregnant and do OnlyFans at the same time. So she's like, if I look pregnant all the time, because I've got a belly and I just kind of allude to it, I'm going to do this. And she was already big on her own doing like normal OnlyFans stuff. And then she just did this and posted on all the Reddit boards for that fetish. And she started printing money. And all she does, she doesn't even post news. She just posts like her fucking tummy. Awesome. And dudes are like, yeah, belly. People are into anything. That's why I'm like, I don't think there's such thing as an ugly person. You just, you just haven't, you just haven't found your niche. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Before we end the podcast, uh, it's time for miscellaneous bit of the end, where I answer emails sent in by the listener. All right. Uh, so if you want to email the show, if you have, if you have a question for me, if you need some life advice, if you have a question, if you have a story that you think would be good. Um, Send an email to podcast at lewspears.com, L-E-W-spears.com. Um, all right. And please don't send me four paragraphs. I'm not going to read it. Look at this. Sorry, dude. Jesus. That could be the best uh, story in the world. Uh, it's not even formatted. It's not even formatted. Uh, I'll read the subject line. Coworkers gassed me up for a workplace relationship and my autistic ass might have ruined it. See, that's probably a great story, but it's way too long. I'm not going to read it. Isn't that great? If, if uh, Here's his, his a good um, diagnostic for the, the autism spectrum disorder. If you are sending a podcast an email and it has six paragraphs, you've got that shit. <laughs> Reword it. Make it smaller. I might read it. Um all right, here we, we've got this. Mentally dealing with injury. Hey, Lewis. Uh, firstly, I've been a fan for Yonks, uh, and it's incredible to see you happy and healthy. It's extremely deserved, and I can't wait to see where this current momentum takes you. Thank you, dude. Now, on New Year's Day, I snapped my wrist oh, on my dominant hand skateboarding. Oh, I hate that. Anything wrist and ankle and knee, I fucking hate it. I snapped my wrist on my dominant hand skateboarding at a music festival. I was sober too. <laughs> yeah, brutal. How embarrassing. So that's like, you're not even like, oh, I was so drunk. You just sucked at skateboarding. You shouldn't have been on it. You know, that's a real dad injury, isn't it? Yeah. Like just breaking your wrist on a skateboard because you used to skate when you were 21. Now you're 40 and you, you want to be cool in front of your kids. Next thing you know, you're not jacking off for four months. Now on New Year's Day this year, I snapped my wrist on my dominant hand skateboarding. After 18 days of waiting for surgery, my fingers were able to move freely and I could hold around a kilo. 
It's now day three post-surgery and I can't move my fingers or bear any weight on my wrist, which is really frustrating and has made me regret the surgery. Obviously, this will improve with time, three to six months, but I was just wondering if you have any advice on how to deal with not being able to do much, particularly on being able to handle being set back. Dude, you've come to the right bloke. It's really tough because, uh, you know, my... Uh, I could still work with my illness that I had, but I did a pretty poor job at it and it was exhausting. What was pretty tough with my surgery, the recovery, both of them, I could not work at all. Like I couldn't speak, you know, for a good two months, both so both times. Um, and particularly with the first surgery, I had all that metal in my mouth. I had the expander. So I was lisping and I was spitting and I mean, you go back and listen to the podcast episodes where I'm talking about, oh, the lift isn't that bad. It was bad. I was in complete denial. It's really hard. Um, and it's very cliche, but you do just have to focus on what you can do. Like, what can you do? All right. You're lucky. You've got two hands. You can use your left hand. Right. And there's another thing. There's a book that really helped me, uh, written by an old Stoic philosopher called Epictetus. Uh, and his name, I think, literally means something like owned one or slave or something like that. He was a slave for his entire life until he was really old. And his his uh, the guy that owned him beat him so badly that he had a limp forever. Um, so I was like, you know, everyone gets into Marcus Aurelius, who was an emperor, to learn about Stoic philosophy. I was like, nah, I don't want to learn about the emperor and his struggles. I want to learn from the guy who was a slave his entire life, who's called Mr. Slave, who uh, was beaten so badly he couldn't walk. All right. How the fuck did he get through that? Um, and he wrote something that was really good, which was basically like, uh, you know, you can, uh, it's, I'm paraphrasing, but it's something along the lines of, uh, you can chain my body, but not even God can chain my will. Uh, and that's something I thought about a lot is like when my body wasn't working, it's like, okay, but like I'm free in here in my mind. You know, if this dude can get through slavery and being crippled when there's no fucking internet, <laughs> I think I can handle, you know, not talking for a while and getting a surgery that while two surgeries that while they were like really tough, really expensive set me back a lot, at the end of it, I'll feel like this, how I feel now, and I feel great, right? Which is awesome. Not many people get to, you know, go into a scary multiple surgery procedure and come out look, looking better, feeling better, and having no side effects. Like, that, that. that's what was on the cards for me. So I'm like, dude, if people can get, like, cancer cut out of their face or if women can get their breasts removed, you know, to save their life. I think I'll be all right with getting the surgery that makes me look more handsome to save my life. Um, so it's, it's, it's a little bit about perspective, but it's also acknowledging like, yeah, there are people that are going through worse and there are people that, uh, that are going through worse all the time. Uh, but that doesn't mean that your suffering does not count. You know, you have to feel it. You have to take it on board. You have to acknowledge it and you have to not shut it out and not put it away, um, you have to go, yeah, this does suck and this is awful. And maybe you do need to cry about it a little bit or a lot. But at some point you do have to be like, okay, I've done that. I've processed it. What am I going to do next? Uh, and, and there's always, always, always the question, what can I do? What can I actually do? I can't do this. I can't do that. And that's awful. And that's true. And that does suck. But what can you do? You know, for me, I was like, okay, I am so tired all the time. I feel so fucking horrible. I can't speak properly. What can I do? And what I could do was I could edit and I edited stand-up clips. That's what I could do. I tried to do a little bit of that. I knew that I could write some things. So I kind of plotted out a few things and I, and I planned what I was going to do when I was finished. I could do those things. And I was like, okay, well, I know that I have to stop doing things. So I had to let go my team you know, which was really hard and really tough. But if I kept them on board, I would have just ended up fucking losing even more than what I lost. So sometimes you have to, like a lot of people are like, don't ever quit. And sometimes it's not quitting to admit that what you're trying to do is impossible for now. You know, like if, for example, with your hand, 
if you <laughs> if you want to fucking play video games. It's not quitting to stop playing video games if you can't use your hands for now. That's not quitting. You know, so that was a really hard thing for me to do of like, I felt like I was failing, like letting everybody go. It was awful. You know, I had to get them on calls and make them redundant and fucking I cried after each call. And then I had to, you know, be like, all right, I've, I've done that. I've felt that time to fire the next person. <laughs> it was awful, you know, and much worse for them than it was for me. I wasn't even the one losing my job. I just felt like I was failing, you know, and then I sat, I sat in this, uh, in the, I, you know, I mean, you guys saw it. I, I, it's not this room, but it's a whole office that I fucking built and set up. And, you know, I spent all this money to get high speed internet there. And I put all this gear and equipment and desks and computer and monitors. And, and then I just fucking sat in there. And I, was, and I was just like, man, I feel like I fucking failed. I set up this whole office and now it's useless. And I still don't go in that room because it makes me feel sad. <laughs> but it's, but to, to do otherwise would be, you know, I feel like a lot of people are like, just don't ever quit. And it's like, not continuing to bash your head against a wall, you know, deciding to stop attempting what is impossible is not quitting. It's like, all right, I'm going to stop. I'm going to take a step back and I'm going to figure out a way around this wall. You know, it's like, okay, if I, if I want to have a team, I'm going to have to let everyone go because I can't afford it. Because if I don't, I'm going to lose fucking everything and then I'll never come back from it. You know, the only way to kind of build up again is to let shit go, right? Sometimes that's a relationship. If you're with a girlfriend or a boyfriend or a partner and it's like, fuck, I really want to be happy and I really want a good relationship. So you just try and make this broken thing work. You're like, uh, I kind of explain it as uh, for a really, really long time, I was trying to hold this broken cup together. And as long as I held it like this, the water wouldn't spill. But as long as I held it like this, it was cutting my hands and it was hurting me. And it was really bad for me. And I was like, yeah, but it's okay because the water isn't spilling. I needed to fucking let it go and get a new cup. You know, wait, let's wait some time. Sometimes you just have to fucking stop. That's what I had to do. And it's, it's really hard and it feels like failing. And in some ways it is. Sometimes something doesn't work and you fucking, ah, I tried. But if you keep trying to fucking, you know, Frankenstein something along that's like completely impossible, you often end up doing much more harm to yourself than good. Like a, a great example is this, is, is the gap year tour that I did. I, I mean, I was kind of backed into a corner. I really needed the money. Uh, and I did have a good show that I wanted to do. And I hadn't toured for a really long time. So I did really want to get out there. But... If I were to have my time again, instead of going out there and doing a tour that I love doing the shows and the shows were good, but it really hurt me doing it. And I was not well enough to be doing it. It was really bad for me. I came home and I was really sick after. And after every show, I kind of collapsed and was like, oh my God, I can't believe I have to do this again. You know, I was doing two shows a night. It was really bad for me. That's, that was when I was at my most sick. I had the gap tooth. I just had recovered I wasn't even recovered from the first surgery. It didn't make me feel any better. In many ways, it made me feel a lot worse, the first one. The second one cured me. The first one was just to make the second one possible. And it was a really bad idea. But I had it in my head of like, I need to make money because if I don't make money, I'm going to have to let everyone go. If I took a moment to kind of step back and actually look at what was happening, I probably would have seen that losing the team was inevitable. And instead of like doing this tour to make enough money to basically keep everyone employed for another six months, I would have been so much better off just letting everyone go and accepting reality, which was I was too sick to be touring and I can't make money. And then I wouldn't, I probably wouldn't have burned through all my savings just desperately trying to keep this broken glass together. It was fucked. And it, it wasn't the people's fault that worked with me. I was sick, you know? Um, and I think that when you get into situations like this, and now I'm not even really talking about your broken wrist, sometimes you get into situations where it, you're in such an emergency state for such a sustained period of time 
that you actually can't think past what's happening now. You know, you either get stuck in the past or you're scared about the future or you just, you can't even fucking think. And you just have to find a way to slow down and think, okay, what's actually happening? And sometimes you need someone else to kind of sit down with you and talk about this, you know? My girl was like, hey man, I don't think you should do this tour. I think that you should let everyone go. And I was like, no, if I do this and I sell this many tickets, I'll get to keep everyone and then the videos will start working and then that will pay everyone's way. Like I was just stuck. And like the tour kept everyone employed for a long time and it paid my bills for much longer. But really what I should have done is let everyone go and then maybe do a really, really small thing to pay for my fucking surgery. Like I, was, I wasn't even thinking about the next surgery that I had to pay for. I just didn't want to let people down is where I was. And uh, you can really get stuck and you have to find a way to kind of slow down and take some fucking breaths. And a really good way to do this is to just go for a walk without your phone, like a huge 30 minute walk. Even if you do on a loop of the block or whatever, you go on nowhere, you just need to go for a walk and fucking think often, you know, uh, I think Ryan holiday has this quote of like, it might not even be his, his quote, but he talks about it a lot of like, uh, you might not solve all your problems with a walk, but you're definitely not going to make them worse. And uh, even if you don't come with a solution, it fucking makes you feel better. So if you can go for a walk or a bike ride or a swim or like whatever you can do, a walk is really helpful. And now I do that every day. Um, and yeah, you just have to take a step back. Sometimes when you're in a sustained period of, of, of need and hurt and emergency, you can really fuck it. You can't think... Uh, of like what's actually happening. You're just trying to survive and trying to, I was just stuck trying to make things not worse. You know, I was like fostering a kid at the time, my son. And so I was like worried, like, man, if I run out of money, this kid's going to have nowhere to go. I need to fucking make money to, because otherwise this kid is going to be, there's nowhere for him to go. So I was worried about that. And then I was like, oh, I really don't want these. I love these people. I don't want them to lose their job. What's going to happen? They're fine. You know, they, they'll get they'll get other jobs. It's okay. You know, and, and I let them go anyway. So it was fucking inevitable. I just ended up harming myself. I was just so worried about protecting other people. I'm like, I'm worried about this kid. I'm worried about these people that are on my team. I'm worried about letting my fans down. I really don't want to fucking disappear and all of those things, other than letting the kid down, he's fine, which is really good. But everything else happened anyway. And if I was to go back in time with the head that I have on my shoulders now, uh, I would have been able to see that. And it was exceedingly obvious if I just took a week off, stopped and looked at my finances and looked at the road ahead of me, which was more surgeries. So it's like, even if this impossible plan that I had of like, I'll do this tour and then the clips will go viral and then I'll come back and I'll do YouTube videos and they'll start working again and they'll make my, even if those things happened, I would have gotten the surgery and then it would have all gone to dust anyway. I would have had to stop again. So it's like, what I was trying to do, I was trying to do an impossible thing that even if it did pay off, Six months down the line, it all would have fucking fallen apart again because I would have had to take all this time off and spend all of this money on the surgery that I needed. But instead, I fucking spent all of my money, had to let everyone go anyway, and had to ask my mum for money for the surgery, you know? And then and then almost lost my house over it. Like, I just made things so much worse by not taking the time to consider reality. Um, and sometimes when you're stuck in this place of like, oh man, I feel useless and stuff. Sometimes you have to go, yeah, you know what? I'm, I'm, I have to acknowledge that I'm sick and I'm not very useful right now. And that's okay. And the only way that I got better was by disappearing and working on myself and going, I need to stop trying to fucking please other people and not let my fans down and all this other kind of stuff. And now I'm at a point where I'm like physically healthy, obviously, but if I didn't stop and go away and do all this work on myself. There's no way that I would be mentally okay to continue. I would have been fucking damaged by all this shit that I went through. So sometimes you just have to stop and, uh, and, and stop trying to do the impossible. And uh, a lot of people are like, man, if I stop, that means I quit. And it's like quitting is not 
a permanent thing, you know, and it's not quitting to admit that it's not possible. You know, it's like, it's like, it's, it's like you can't keep entering the lottery going, Oh, one more time and I'll win. It's like, that's not, it's not happening, dude. So sometimes you just have to stop and slow down and acknowledge reality and go, all right, the only way that I'm going to be able to do this thing is to actually stop trying to do it and solve this problem. And sometimes that problem is your mental health or your physical health. And the only way to, to, to fix those things is to fucking slow down and actually pay attention to them. You know, like there was no way I was going to be able to work my way through my recovery. Impossible. And now, and that tour that I did, I was, my, my logic was I need clips so that I can post them during my recovery. I just the other day, a couple of weeks ago, because I wanted to sell tickets to Perth, I wanted to edit the clips from that tour because I have that and I have like the whole Melbourne Comedy Festival and I open up the project file and this horrible, awful feeling of despair washed over me and I just got this huge message from myself back then of leave me there. (laughs) You know, I don't want to, I can't look at myself when I'm that ill and I don't want to post clips there's some really funny clips there's some really funny stand up but i look awful and it's not about how i look i look sick and scared and like i'm suffering and i don't want to put that shit out there because i'm so well now and i'm so much better and i am so changed that i don't firstly i can't handle looking at it it's too painful for me to look at myself back then when i'm fucking denying reality and stressed about everything and just like in a lot of pain and sick and suffering but also you know some of these clips man even if they are funny like i look fuck i looked i look sick i have this dark vibe and energy about me i look like i'm in pain because i am and that's another thing that i've noticed is i've put i only put up a couple clips from perth but uh one of them's going really well the other two are going okay but so many more people are following me than normal than if I were to get the same amount of views on a clip from back then. I think it's just my, my fucking energy is really different and my vibe and I look so much more open and well, like people can just detect health. I think that's what attractiveness is. Like I had a a receding jawline and that made me less attractive because people could see that I was a less healthy partner to mate with, you know? And now I've got a chin and people are treating me different and shit. And like more people are following me. It's, it's just like a, I don't know. And, and, but it's also like my whole energy and my whole vibe is completely different. And like, sometimes like you're okay. Your hand doesn't work. Fine. What can you do now? Don't the reason why you're so fucked up and sad is because you're trying to do things that are impossible. It's like, oh, I used to be able to hold this and now I can't and I really want to hold it. And it's like, that's an imagined problem. You know that you're going to get better. You know that you're one day going to be able to hold that. So why the fuck are you trying to do anything other than heal? The reason why you're so upset and and frustrated and despairing is because you're trying to do an impossible thing. You're bashing your head against a wall. And that's where your problems come from. It's like an imagined suffering of like, oh, fuck, I wish I could fly and I can't. This is this sucks. I just I just want to be able to. You'll never be able to fly, dude. And you you won't be able to use your hand until it's healed. So the only thing that you should be doing is focusing on your healing, and then you can get a lot of joy from that. Like when I with this, I stopped doing everything before my second surgery. I learned, and I disappeared. And I told you guys I was going away, so you weren't expecting anything, and I didn't have any employees, and no one was relying on me for anything. And I got a lot of joy out of healing and learning how to use my new face and and looking in the mirror and being like, oh, today the swelling is down. What a huge win. Whereas before I'd be like, oh man, the videos that we pre-filmed to, to come out aren't getting many views or I can't, I need to edit this and, but I'm too sick and all that shit's impossible. I, I, like I got a lot of value out of like really making my world a lot smaller for a little bit and being like, okay, the only thing I'm going to focus on is healing. And then when I was healed, then I started work when I'm healthy and now I don't have any of that shit in my fucking head. Now I'm like, oh, awesome. I get to do shows and if I make a profit, that's a huge fucking win. 
and I'm slowly paying off all this debt that I got myself into trying to bash my head against the wall that never would have happened if I didn't, if I just accepted what was happening and, and just like didn't quit, just stopped while I was sick. That's all I had to do. And that's all you have to do. Sometimes you, and, and that could be a relationship. Sometimes you just have to stop. It's like, fuck, this, this person is never going to be a good partner to me. I've tried this. I've tried that. They're trying nothing. All you can do is all you can do. And you need to focus on what's in your control. And if they're not trying in the relationship, you got to leave. Or if you can't use your fucking hand, then you need to focus on healing, you know? And, and if you're going to focus on all the things that you can't do that you used to be able to do, guess what, dude? You have a broken wrist. <laughs> so accept that and deal with that. All right. That's the podcast. We're going to continue on Patreon. If you want to support the show, patreon.com uh, slash Lou Spears. There's a, a Discord. There's a bunch of other stuff. I would love to see you over there. And it really, really does support me uh, on my journey back from all of this stuff. So talk to you next Sunday. I hope you have a shit one. Bye.